In this video, I will show you how to use the TCS3200 color sensor with an Arduino. This is a very popular color sensor used for Arduino in projects where you need to detect colors. So for example, sorting objects like Lego bricks by color, or building a robot that is more advanced than your basic line following robot that follows a black line on a white surface and can instead react to different colors on the floor. You can see I have it configured in this demonstration here to light up one of three LEDs depending on whether it detects a red, green, or blue surface. However, this sensor and the associated code don't just magically tell you, oh, this is red and oh, this is green. So what we're going to do in this video is explain more about how this sensor works and how you can interpret the output from the sensor and calibrate it to detect different colors. Let's start with a close-up look at the sensor itself. The key to the sensor is in the middle here. We have an array of photodiodes, and a photodiode is kind of like the opposite of an LED. If you're familiar with LEDs, you might know that they convert electrical current to light. A photodiode converts light to electrical current, and that is what allows you to measure the amount of light hitting this little array of photodiodes in here. Depending on where you buy your sensor, it may or may not have this black plastic housing kind of around that array. And it's usually going to have some white LEDs surrounding the array, and that just helps you make sure you are getting a lot of white light reflected off of the surface you're measuring, even if there isn't a lot of ambient light in the room. The sensor board also has a bunch of pins. We will talk a little in a little more detail later about what all of these do, but we have VCC pins for power, one on each side. Those are going to be 5 volts from your Arduino. We also have GND ground pins for ground. And again, we will talk a little bit more later about what these other pins do. Those are male pins sticking out the back of the board here, so you can connect to those with male to female jumper wires and then use the other end of the jumper wire to connect over to your breadboard and your Arduino. Now, here is what I mean when I say that this sensor doesn't just magically tell you what color you're looking at. It is actually a light to frequency converter. It converts the amount of light reflected back and measured by the photodiodes to the frequency of something called a square wave. So this tool I have here is called an oscilloscope, and it produces a graph of the voltage or the signal that is output by this sensor. And the frequency of this square wave is a measure of how fast it is, how close together these pulses are. So higher frequency means it's faster and the pulses get shorter and closer together. So if you haven't taken a physics class yet, that's just a really quick qualitative introduction to what frequency means. So what you will see is if I take this sensor and just aim it down at the white surface here, as I get closer to the surface, more of the light from these LEDs is reflected back to the sensor and this frequency goes up, so the pulses got shorter and closer together. Similarly, if I hold the sensor at a fixed distance from the surface, but slide it over a black piece of paper instead of white paper, less light is reflected back to the photodiodes and the frequency goes down, so the pulses got bigger and farther apart. Now, that information alone doesn't tell us anything about color. You can see uh, that I can aim the sensor at the different colored pieces of paper here, and the frequency of this square wave does change, but it's not really immediately obvious which one is for which color. So in addition, the key thing we're going to use to differentiate colors is that we actually have four different sections of photodiodes on the sensor here, each one with a different color filter that lets a different color of light through. So right now I am using the clear filter that just lets all light through, but we can also select red, green, or blue filters. So for example, if we select the green filter, we expect that it would let green light through, but block other wavelengths of light. So we would get a higher reading or higher frequency when we're looking at green, but not at the other colors. We can change which filter we're using, using the Arduino code, which we will look at later in the video, but for now, I'm going to manually switch it over to the green filter, and then we're going to take a look at the output on the oscilloscope as I look at the different colors. So I have now switched over to the green filter, which does not visibly change anything about the sensors. So I still just have these external white LEDs providing white light. 
you're not going to look at the sensor and see anything green in there. That photodiode array is very tiny, so you can't really identify which array is being used or see those colors with your naked eye. But we're going to be able to see a change in the output on the oscilloscope. So watch what happens when I aim this now at the green piece of paper and then move it over to either the red or the blue. Since I am using the green filter that is letting green light through but blocking other wavelengths of light, we see that the frequency goes down. Again, those pulses get longer and farther apart when I look at the other colors. So this is how, for example, I could differentiate between green and other colors. I can tell that if these pulses are below a certain width or a certain threshold, then I'm looking at green and not red or blue. But using the green filter alone does not help me tell the difference between red and blue. To do that, I'm going to also need to check the readings for the red and blue filters, and that's where the Arduino code is going to come in because you can cycle through all three filters, look at the values, and then calibrate it to identify different colors. So now, let's switch over to the computer and look at the Arduino code. Before we look at the code, we're actually going to look at the data sheet for the sensor. And if you are not familiar with data sheets for electronic parts, they can be a little intimidating and include a lot of information that you don't necessarily need just to use it with an Arduino. The important thing we want to find on this data sheet is the description of the different pins and what they do. So again, remember I mentioned those pins S0, S1, S2, and S3 earlier, as well as the output pin. So the out pin is what we were just looking at on the oscilloscope. That is the voltage output from the sensor that we are going to read from the Arduino. But these S pins are what we use to select which color filter we are using. There's a little table here that tells you which pin settings you need to select each color. For example, if pin S2 is set to low and pin S3 is set to low, then that is going to select the red filter and so on. S2 low, S3 high gives the blue filter, S2 high, S3 low gives the clear filter, and S2 high, S3 high gives the green filter. So we are going to write Arduino code that cycles through the red, blue, and green filters to take all three readings. Note that we also have the S0 and S1 pins for output frequency scaling. So that is going to change the frequency of the entire square wave. You can either have it at the full 100% value or you can slow it down significantly to either 20% or 2%. So this is useful depending on the microcontroller you're using and how fast it is or how good it is at measuring these pulses. You might want to slow it down so you can get better readings. So we don't need to cycle through this during the program, we're just going to pick one that works best, and it turns out that the 20% value works pretty well with the Arduino. So in the code, you're going to see that we're just going to set this output frequency scaling value to 20% using the S0 and S1 pins. Now let's take a look at the code. As usual with Arduino programs, we define a bunch of variables first. So I have a bunch of constant variables because they don't change to define the pin numbers I'm using. For example, I have pin S0 from the sensor connected to pin 2 on the Arduino, and so on. So you don't have to use these pins if you're doing another project with other things connected. You can move these pins around, but make sure you have the physical pin on the sensor wired to the pin that matches in the software in your code. I also have three pins for those LEDs you saw earlier with variables defined for them, red LED, green LED, and blue LED. And then I have variables for the widths of the pulses that we're going to measure. Now, no, these don't have the constant in front of them because they are going to change. In the setup function, we have a bunch of pin mode commands defining almost all of the pins as output except for the signal pin that is going to be the input from the sensor, but all of the other pins are outputs. And then we set the S0 and S1 pins for that frequency scaling. And again, I have transcribed that data table from the data sheet directly here into comments in the code, so you don't have to refer back to the data sheet. To set that 20% frequency scaling, we want pin S0 high and S1 low, so we do that here with the digital write command. 
We also initialize serial communication so we can print out our red, green, and blue values to the serial monitor, which is useful for calibrating your code for the different colors you're going to measure. In the loop function, this is where we are going to cycle through the different filters and take a reading for each one. So again, I have transcribed the table from the datasheet here where we have the S2 and S3 pin settings for each of the pins. So we're gonna cycle through those by using the digital write command to set S2 and S3 to the corresponding settings from that table. And then we are going to use the Arduino pulse in command. So this command measures the duration of a pulse in microseconds. And we define whether we want to measure the high part of the pulse or the low part of the pulse. So if you remember those pulses we saw on the oscilloscope screen earlier, and I'll put those up in the corner of the screen again here, this is measuring the amount of time it takes from when that pulse goes high, so the rising edge from when it goes from low to high, to when it goes low again, so the falling edge from when it goes to from high to low, and saves that in the variable clear. I then use the digital write command to switch over to the red filter, do the same thing to measure the next pulse, store that in the variable red, and do the same thing for the green and blue filters. So I now have all four values, even though I'm not actually going to use the clear value, I measure it just in case I wanna do something with it, and I'm going to look at the red, green, and blue values. So if I now upload this code and look at the serial monitor where I'm printing out these three values, it's important to remember that as more light goes through, the frequency goes up, but when frequency goes up, those pulses get faster and closer together, so the pulse width that I am measuring with the pulse in command goes down. So lower pulse width means more light. You have to be careful. Some of the other tutorials you will find for this sensor online get frequency and pulse width mixed up. They are the inverse of each other, so more light, means higher frequency, which means pulse width goes down. So right now, I am holding the sensor over the green piece of paper, and you can see that the green number here is about in the 40s, red is in the 70s, blue is in the 50s. If I switch it over to the red piece of paper, with as I am cycling through these different filters, we should expect that the red value will go down because I'm gonna get more red light reflected off of the red paper and the other values will go up. So let's see what happens if I switch over to the red paper. We see that blue didn't really change too much, but green went up quite a bit to almost 80 and red dropped down to almost 30. Now this could be sufficient to calibrate the readings you get for different colors, but at least personally, I find it a little counterintuitive that a brighter color or more of the color gives you a lower number here. So what we can do next is use the Arduino map function to switch that around to a more intuitive range where a bigger number means more of that color. So I had those lines commented out here. I'm going to uncomment them now. And what I am doing here is again, if you're not familiar with the Arduino map function, it takes a number in one range and maps it to another range. So I am taking my calibrated values here, again, I was seeing numbers kind of between 30 and 80 when I tested my different color samples. So I wanna take numbers between that range, but I wanna reverse them. So that's why I have 81st and 32nd here and map them to a zero to 255 range, which if you're familiar with, for example, how colors are defined in pixels on a computer screen is kind of a standard way to describe RGB values. So I'm gonna take, again, my numbers, which are currently in this range of 30 to 80-ish when I look at my different color samples and switch them over to this RGB value range where I'm gonna get a more intuitive representation of the color. Now having uploaded that code, we see this more intuitive representation where I am currently holding the sensor over the green paper. We see a very low red value and a high green value, but if I switch it over to the red paper, then the red value goes up and the green value goes down. Now these just pieces of construction paper that I have are not perfect or pure color, right? So I'm not getting 255 for red and then zero for green and blue. They are actually a bit of a mix of the three colors, but ideally the purer the color is, the more perfect red, green, or blue you have, then you'll get closer to 255 and closer to zero for the other two values.
And again, if you want to do this, you need to go through the same calibration process I just did where you're going to need to look at the pure pulse numbers before mapping them, kind of see what your range is, and then adjust these numbers accordingly. You also don't have to map them to a 0 to 255 range. You could do 0 to 100 or 0 to 1000 or whatever makes the most sense to you. I just did 0 to 255 because, again, that is a common way to represent RGB values. However, regardless of how you do this, whether you keep the straight pulse values or map them to some other range, these three numbers on their own do not tell you, is this red or is this blue or is this green? That is where you are going to need to define conditions for if statements depending on your calibration and the colors you expect. So if you have a robot that is driving around in an environment where you are going to have certain colors set up, or you are sorting Lego bricks that you know are certain colors, you can define thresholds for all three values. So for example, I am holding over the red right now, and you can see that depending on how you have your map function set up, the numbers can actually get a little crazy and wrap around here. You see my green number goes off the charts when I hold my sensor too far away from the table. So remember that way back in the beginning of the video, I demonstrated how moving the sensor up and down also affects the amount of light reflected back to it. So again, you have to be careful with your calibration for both your colors and how far the sensor is from the surface. But anyway, when I am holding it over the red here, I can see that Okay, my red is above 200, and my green and blue are below th both below 100. So I'm setting very coarse thresholds for that's what I'm going to call red. And if I move over to my green, I see, okay, now my green is over 150. Blue is actually a little bit over 100, so maybe I'll say blue is below 150, and red is very safely below 100. So I'm going to define green as red less than 100 and green greater than 150 and blue less than 150. And again, these numbers are going to change depending on the ambient lighting in your environment and exactly what surfaces you are measuring. You could also go through and do this for other colors. So I didn't do purple or orange or white or black, but you can check any colors you want really. And as long as you can define the thresholds or the range that you are getting for that color, you can write a condition to detect it and then take some action depending on your project. In this case, I am turning on the corresponding LED matching for that color. But again, this could be something totally different, like a robot that reacts to the color and knows to stop if it sees red and go if it sees green. Finally, down here at the bottom of the code, we have these serial print commands that are printing out these values. I also had this else part of the if, else if, statement conditions that just told us to do nothing, but I had commented that out earlier. So if you don't detect any of the colors and you want to have some other default action that you take, you can have that as well. Remember that if you want to download this code, you can get it from the link in the video description if you don't want to have to follow along and type it all in yourself. We also don't really have a circuit diagram for this tutorial, but you can just read the pin connections in the comments at the beginning here because again, these are just connected directly from the sensor to the Arduino with those male to female jumper wires. So you don't really need a separate circuit diagram. And the LEDs, if you're not sure how to use LEDs, we have another video at the very beginning of our Arduino tutorial series that talks about LEDs and current limiting resistors and all that stuff. So again, you can find all of those links along with links to our website with cool science projects you can do with an Arduino in the description of this video. You can also find over a thousand other projects in all areas of science and engineering on our website, www.sciencebuddies.org.